Please be seated. Our scripture reading this afternoon will be from Ephesians 3, verses 6, 3, 16 through 19. That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of Christ. Thank you, brother. It's so good to be back with you all this afternoon. So grateful for the singing. And by the way, there is now a song leading class taking place for the young people on Wednesdays uh, that the elders had decided to put on. And I am grateful for uh, Steve Rogers leading that. Uh, grateful for all of our song leaders. Um, we do need some song leaders for uh, Gary Hedrick's funeral. We have at least one song leader, uh, but we have several songs that are um, scheduled to, to be sung that uh, Gary um, really identified with and uh, the family has identified in terms of songs that would be appropriate as his life is celebrated and we reflect upon uh, his life here. Um, we have, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven songs. We may not sing all of them, uh, but like I said, we have at least one uh, song leader. And uh, if you are able to lead singing for that service, it's 2 p.m. on Saturday, the 25th. That's this upcoming Saturday. If you would, just let me know. And probably by Wednesday or so, we'll actually have an itinerary for that service and uh, pin down what all will be taking place in terms of who uh, will be leading what. Uh, grateful for the scripture reading we just had and uh, grateful for this study as we're thinking about praying for one another. And again, the, the way the s series of lessons went uh, about and were organized for this week, I thought was very well done. It was very encouraging as you really unpacked Ephesians chapter 3 and you look at what Paul is praying for regarding the congregation there in Ephesus. As we studied together this morning, uh, looking at several of those points, uh, looking at Ephesians chapter 3, uh, Paul points out there, beginning in verse 16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love uh, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And so we looked at Primarily four points. He's praying for their strength. Notice there in verse 16, he's praying that Christ may dwell in their hearts, verse 17, that they might be rooted and grounded in love, verse 17, and that, that they would be uh, filled with all the fullness of God, verse 19. And then uh, throughout the week, he then broke down each one of those points and drilled down a little deeper. And what we're going to do this afternoon is drill down on the point of strength and looking at praying for strength and uh, the need to be strong and how really it is that we can be strong in the Lord. And as you think about this, I want you to uh, contemplate going back to what he writes as we study this morning in Ephesians chapter 6. And let's look there starting in verse 10 and look at what is required in order to be properly equipped so that we can be strong, uh, so that we can stand where no one stands alone, as we just sang a few minutes ago. What a beautiful, beautiful song, and I've heard folks comment before in terms of what it is they fear most in this life, and usually it's something along the lines of just being alone. And what a blessing it is that as a child of God, we never are alone. We have fellowship with one another in Christ, and ultimately we're able to stand with God and be in fellowship with him. Uh, Paul lays that out as to how this is accomplished here in Ephesians chapter 6. Let's look at this once again. Verse 10, beginning, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of of the devil, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, 
Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And so you see here a formula, uh, clarity in terms of how it is we can be equipped, how it is we can be strong and protected regarding the difficulties of this life and being able to cope and navigate through the challenges that we get dealt throughout this life. Uh, and obviously our adversary, the one that is walking about and seeking to devour us like a roaring lion, as Peter points out in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, is the one who is behind all the difficulties that we would face, as Paul likewise points out here. Um, let's contemplate what really he breaks down in terms of what's protected and how it is that we are strong given this context. Gird waste with truth. Notice there in verse 14. Well, Jesus prays in John chapter 17 and verse 17, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. So how is it that our waist is going to be girded with truth? It is going to be via the word of God. A breastplate of righteousness. Psalm 119, 172, all the commandments of God are righteousness. And so how is it that we are going to have this breastplate of righteousness? We know the commandments of God. Feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. Well, what is the gospel? We really think about what the gospel is. Let's look at Colossians chapter 1, for example, in verse 5. He says, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. And so the gospel is the word of truth. Likewise, Peter will state in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 25 regarding the gospel, he says, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. And so how is my feet going to be shod with the preparation of the gospel? The word of God, shield of faith, shield of faith. Sometimes people get the idea that faith is uh, in reference to personal faith, there are multiple different types of faith found within uh, the New Testament, one of them being the faith system. Notice, for example, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 23, Paul writes, if indeed you continue in the faith. And so this is not personal faith. This is not individual faith. This is the gospel system of faith. He's saying if you continue in the faith, and notice he goes on, grounded and steadfast and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard. And so being uh, in a state where you are continuing on, you're on a, on a continual uh, pathway, on a continuum of the faith, it means you are living and breathing in the hope of the gospel. So shield of faith, again, connected there to the word of God. Helmet of salvation, verse 17. Helmet of salvation. Notice Acts chapter 13 and verse 26. Acts chapter 13 and verse 26. Men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God, to you the word of this salvation has been sent. And so uh, salvation has come via the word of God. Notice also Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. In him who in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And so how is it that I'm going to put on the helmet of salvation? The helmet of salvation has been delivered via the word. And then finally, sword of the spirit. It says it right there. It is the word of God. It is the word of God. And so what is it that these areas are pointing out in terms of what it is that's protected? How is it that we are made strong by equipping ourselves with the word of God given these areas? Well, I want you to think about, for example, the waste. Your waste is to be girded about with truth. And uh, football, we used to have, I don't even think they make them anymore. Uh, now the football pants are made in such a way where all the pads come in there together. When I was growing up, uh, it didn't work that way. You had to 
put in your pads individually in each little pocket within the pants. And you also had what was called a girdle. And the girdle basically girded your waist and it protected your, uh, your vulnerable areas. It protected your hips. It protected your tailbone. It protected your waist area. And so you think about a girdle. Your vulnerabilities are protected via the truth, via the word of God. What about the breastplate of righteousness? What does a breastplate protect? It protects your heart. It protects your emotions. Our emotions are able to be protected as we invest them into the word of God. What about your feet? What is it that your feet do? Well, your feet walk on pathways. Your feet walk on uh, various uh, roadways and really ultimately direct your plans. So your feet are to be guided, are to be protected by the word of God. Our plans should be in check with God's word. You think about what the psalmist writes in Psalm 119. Psalm 119, uh, notice here in verse, uh, let's see, Psalm 119, my picture memory has gone to my new King James and I have forgotten where it is. Let's see, Psalm 119 and verse Packer crew, they should be helping me out right here. I know they know it. I know it too. I, ah, verse 105. For some reason, I want to say verse 11. Verse 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And so, again, God's word shows us where our feet currently are, where they present are, uh, presently are, but likewise, it shows us where we are going and the direction we are headed in. And so, our feet directs our plans. Our plans should be guided by, should be checked against the sovereignty of God, the will of God, the word of God. Think about what James tells us in James chapter 4, starting there in verse 13. He says, come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. Our feet, that which directs our path and that which we use to walk down pathways, which drives our plans, need to be guided and surrounded by the word of God. Uh, what, about, what about this shield of faith? What is a shield of protect you from? Why don't you think about various threats that might come about and safety, the perimeter of your overall survival. You think about a shield and what it's capable of doing as you're maybe uh, in the midst of battle or as the possibility of debris or shrapnel might be in your vicinity. A shield can protect you from that. So God's word protects us from all the different types of consequences that might be occurring because of the evil and sinful world that we are constantly surrounded by. All of the, the uh, outcomes of the world's ways don't have to pollute our minds and our way of life, but instead we can use the shield of faith to block it and to guard ourselves from it. Uh, notice also the helmet of salvation. What does a helmet protect? Helmet protects your mind. It protects your thoughts. And so God's word is capable of uh, protecting and conditioning our mind to avoid evil thoughts and uh, uh, sinful, wicked ways of thinking. Think about what Paul tells the Philippians, for example, in chapter 4 and in verse 8. He says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, Whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And so our mind and the helmet of salvation, our mind is able to be protected, guarded constantly, meditating and dwelling upon these spiritual truths, uh, things that are pure rather than things that are worldly and wicked that our world is consumed by. And then finally here, the sword of the Spirit. What, what do we use a sword for? Well, it, it is survival, ultimate survival. If we're in a defensive posture, we're not going around wielding a sword and just attacking people with it. But if we ever get to the point where we have to use that type of weapon for defense, we're able to strike our opponent in order to be defended. So God's word is able 
to deliver such a blow to the threats that surround us. And so think about strength and praying for strength and the word of God and how it is applied to our lives and all these various aspects of our life so that we can maintain strength in our daily living. Now, I want you to convert that over because we don't walk around with armor on any longer. Uh, Folks back in the first century would have been much more acclimated and used to this. Not that they necessarily were wearing armor, but certainly Roman soldiers would have been, and they would have been used to seeing folks wearing armor in their generations. We don't have that today. So in our world, how can we consider and contemplate being strong and strength? Uh, I'm going to partake in one of my favorite activities, Lord willing, later on this week, and that is going to see the doctor. For the annual checkup. I don't particularly enjoy going to see the doctors. As a matter of fact, it's only because of my secular employment that basically uh, provokes me to go so that I can get a lower health premium for next year. And also my loving wife who provokes me to go to make sure that I'm healthy and okay. That's the reason why I go. But when I go, I don't enjoy it. Why? Well, I get pricked and prodded. I feel like you know, cattle going in there and, you know, they tell you how you're doing and really you're told you can't eat anything you want to eat and you need to move more. And it's just a, it's a tough experience. And that's at least for me. But what are the different aspects that usually get dealt with? What is it that the the physician, that the doctor typically will highlight and talk to us about regarding our health and our physical stability? Uh, I probably haven't even touched the hem of the garment. Some of you older folks are probably going to come up and see me afterward. But here are some typical areas that will usually get addressed. And sometimes they'll even send you off to a specialist. One of the primary areas, as a matter of fact, you usually get this checked before you even see the doctor, before you even go back into the room. What is that? It's your eyes. You have to usually stand there and do some kind of eye test or something like that as they're weighing you and... Uh, you know, going through you know, your height and so forth, and maybe check your eyes as well. Well, your eye strength, they're really concerned about your vision. They're concerned about, and if you go to a specialist, go to an eye doctor, what do they do? They scan your eye, they look in the, in the back back there, they show you that neat little graph and, and different spots that might exist or might have gotten bigger, and they tell you about glaucoma and other kinds of eye problems that might come up or crop up in future years and ways to avoid that. We care about our vision. We care about whether or not we are able to see. To not see is to make our life more difficult and more challenging. Well, I want you to think about how we would contemplate the strength of vision from a spiritual perspective, because we're concerned about vision in our medical history and health life today. How would we convert that over from a spiritual view? Well, we are commanded to walk by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. In other words, we lived this life not based upon the world that we see around us, not based upon TikTok or Facebook or YouTube TV. We live this life based upon faith, not based upon sight. Well, how does faith come? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so what is it that I need to constantly be reflecting upon? Where is it that my eyes or my mental eyes, my my mind's eye needs to be focused on so that I have healthy vision from a spiritual, from a Christian perspective so that I can be strong to take on the difficulties of this life? It needs to be fixated on that which is associated with the first century. It needs to be fixated on the word of God. And as I dwell upon the Word of God, as I think about the Word of God, as I put my mind and my lifestyle, my self-concept, into the position of those in the first century, I begin to dwell upon how the Word of God can apply to my life today so that I cannot be of this world, but instead be transformed and be a servant for the Lord. Now, Some of you wear glasses. Some of you need your glasses in order to see. I want you to think about for a moment, what would your daily strength status be like if every day you put on first century glasses? Now you put on physical glasses and what happens? The world around you all of a sudden becomes clear. 
You're able to understand it. You're able to digest it. You're able to move about it much more easily, much more smoothly. The experience overall is better because of those glasses. What about first century glasses? What if every day I woke up and I decided I'm going to put on first century glasses so I can be strong in the Lord? I'm not going to see this world based upon the way folks of 2022 see this world. I'm going to see this world based upon the way in which our Lord has provided us his word as delivered in the first century via the New Testament. And I'm going to feast upon it. So that my strength in the Lord, my vision for the Lord can be strong. Are you wearing your first century glasses? What's another area of health that might be analyzed? I think that's a little bit of it too. You walk into the doctor and you you kind of feel like a number on a spreadsheet. and they, They show you where you are in all these various ranges. One of those areas that gets tested is our diet strength. And they usually look at this thing called cholesterol. And that's where they start to tell you that you can't eat what you want to eat anymore. Well, I want you to think a little bit about what it is that we are to be ingesting from a spiritual perspective so that we can make sure we're feasting upon the good spiritual nourishment and we're avoiding those things that would damage our spiritual diet and nourishment. Our Lord tells us, as we read in Matthew chapter 4, he is responding here to Satan in verse 4, he says, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. There is no such thing as good scripture and bad scripture like there is good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. All the word of God is good. And God wants us to feast upon it and live by it. I want you to look at what Paul will tell Timothy as he is uh, guiding him in terms of his role as a preacher, as a servant of the Lord's church there in the first century. First Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6, he says, If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. If you are instructing folks to abstain from error and be mindful of erroneous ways that folks may follow, notice there those first five verses of the same chapter, and you are instead nourished and feasting upon words of faith, you are feasting upon good doctrine, and you're headed in the right direction, Timothy. Then you're having a healthy spiritual diet. What are some other ways that we would evaluate our strength from a health perspective? What about heart strength? Folks sometimes have issues with things such as COPD, maybe have oxygen issues. They have to be put on oxygen, especially now with COVID and the implications of COVID, uh, long-term COVID even. I mean, folks have had to be on oxygen. Uh, Maybe they'll have to be on oxygen for the rest of their life because of it. We care about how well our heart is performing. So when we think about our heart strength, kind of going a little bit back to Ephesians chapter 6 as well, that breastplate of righteousness, what it is that protects our emotions. What is it that our emotions are being driven into? What is it that we love? What is it that we cherish? What is it that we are passionate about and enjoy? Is it God? Is it his kingdom and his word? Seven churches of Asia were being dealt with in the first chapters of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 2, we see beginning there in verse 2, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars, and you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not Become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. You've stood firm in the gospel. You've been aligned with the truth of the word of God and you have rejected error. However, you love something other than God and his kingdom and his word. Your heart has drifted away from the Lord. Folks, our heart health should be evaluated. 
How much do we love God? We're to love God with all of our being. Mark chapter 12, verse 30. Our soul, our mind, our strength, our might, our heart, invested in God out of a love for Him. We used to have an instructor at Memphis who was also a counselor and would describe situations where he would counsel married couples and he would often refer to situations where, for example, the wife would say, I just don't love him anymore. And he said he almost always responded and said, who's the other man? In other words, it's not that you've ceased from loving, it's that you have found another source to love. You have found another outlet whereby to invest your love. And so the question that we need to ask ourselves is, what is it that I love more than God? So that we can evaluate the status of our heart health and our strength. We have our dietary strength, our eye strength, our heart strength. What about the strength of our mind? Alzheimer's is a catastrophic situation that our medical society has still not fully figured out. We have some ideas as to what may cause it, possibly. We haven't figured out the cure, and we don't really know all that there is to know about it yet to be able to guide people correctly where folks just forget those that they live with and who they are, forget where they came from and who they know, and sometimes even forget who they are. As a matter of fact, nowadays, they even have certain exercises that you can do, mind exercises, to try to keep your mind healthy and sound, to keep it on point so that you will not hopefully drift into that type of poor mental strength. What about our mental strength from a spiritual perspective? Uh, We see in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and in verse 7, Paul says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. The gospel is means that I have understanding, I have comprehension, I have health as it relates to my ability to understand and reason with all the difficulties that this life might throw at me. Peter will say in 1 Peter chapter 1 and in verse 13, he says, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Now that's interesting. We were thinking about Uh, girding ourselves, as Paul wrote, gird with the waist of truth, as we looked at in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 14. Here Peter is saying, gird up the loins of your mind. The idea there is when folks would walk around in the first century, especially if they were on guard or needing to maybe move quickly, what would they do? They would essentially hike up their pants. They would hike up the area of their loins so that they could be ready. Well, our minds are to be girded up. In other words, we are to be on guard. We are to be activated and paying attention and engaged regarding the world that is around us. We are commanded to be alert. And Paul will tell the brethren in Colossae, in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. He says, you be watchful. Be paying attention. What is the state of our mind as it relates to our strength and knowledge in the word of God? Are we on guard? Are we activated? Are we engaged? Are we paying attention? Uh, What is your status of strength this afternoon? Uh, As you pray for strength for yourself, as you pray for strength for this congregation, how is it that we can cultivate an atmosphere and facilitate strength? We can have minds that are fixated and sound in the word of God. We can have hearts and emotions that are invested and in love with God and his word. We can have 
a healthy diet of continual consumption of his law and our vision, our eyes can be set on that which was established and delivered in the first century rather than that which we are surrounded by in 2022. Let us pray for strength and let us pursue strength as we seek to be protected and on guard regarding the threats that face us in this life. If you're here this afternoon and you're not yet a child of God, won't you make the decision to become one by putting on Christ via baptism as we read about in Galatians chapter 3, 26 and 27. A child of God has put on Christ via baptism. That baptism is based upon belief and based upon confession in Christ. Just as commanded by Jesus in Mark chapter 16 and verse 16, as Paul writes by inspiration in Romans chapter 10 and verse 10, and as we see exemplified in Acts chapter 8, verses 34 through 39. Have you obeyed the gospel yet this afternoon? If not, we learn that the result of not obeying the gospel is to be eternally separated from God. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. Uh, we don't want that. I wouldn't imagine you want that. God certainly doesn't want that. So won't you obey the gospel this afternoon before it's everlastingly too late? Brother or sister, if you've fallen away, if you're in a state of weakness, you're not strong, you need prayers for strength, we want to pray for you. We want to help you. We want to know what it is you need so that we can be there for you. If you have any spiritual need, won't you please come forward as all together we stand and sing.